Thank you so much. Uh, that was a lovely introduction, and uh, you know it's really nice that someone noted uh, the effort that goes into turning assistant into associate, um, and uh, it's now liberating. I can do um, and say an awful lot without having to worry about being kicked out of my school. Um, so anyway, uh, one of my challenges when putting this together today was uh, you know trying to follow the motto. Of public speaking. Oh yeah, that's great. Well, it's okay. We're good. <laughs> so the motto, the, the the motto of public speaking is that you want to know your audience. So um, just like uh, Professor uh, Fong just said, I spent some time online as well, looking up the non-university and stuff about it. So we'll we'll see that'll show up later. But first. I'm hoping that we can all take out our cell phones because, uh, you know, only about 20% of you have them out so far. So let's get, everyone can take them out. We're going to try something called Kahoot. I don't know if you have done Kahoot before. Um, I will be absolutely honest with you. I have never done this in a presentation before. So I, ha I sat at home with my 10-year-old and 7-year-old boys and I had them try this out, and it worked for them. So I'm hoping it can work work for you as well. So if you have the Kahoot app already, you can open it. If not, you can put a browser in uh, on your phone that says Kahoot.it, or as my son calls it, Kahoot it. So um, and then we'll we'll see if we can get this to work. Um, so, let's give it a try. So, when I was thinking about this, I, I decided that I wanted, I wanted to be a little more interactive uh, than normal. So, uh, as much as I like the sound of my voice, I really like it when the audience gets, gets interacted. So, we're going to try, we're going to try to do this. And what's going to happen is you will see a pin number come up. Let's see, there we go, connecting game pin. So hopefully you can put that into your phone uh, so that people didn't have to type in their names. I made it have a name generator, so it will generate a name for you. You might get something like fluffy zebra or a swimming monkey, I don't know. There, there we go, polite lion, Dr. Panther, all sorts of things like that. So, you can go ahead and put those in, and uh, we're gonna. We're gonna <laughs> I love the names they come up with. This is this is excellent. So we'll give it a start uh, in a few minutes, and then we can see how this goes. And if it works well, uh, I'll, I'll try to continue this going forward. Uh, I've got three more quizzes that we can do if this works well. If this works poorly, then I'll just give up and keep going and, you know, but we'll, we'll just pass it by. So 30 players, oh, they're really starting to pour in now. 33 players, 35 players. It's nice. We could play a, play a three-sided soccer game. Sorry, football game right now, because we have at least 33 people. That's good. All right. 39. Okay. Good. Silly Dragon just signed in. Speedy Glider's there. We wouldn't have started without Diplomat Finch. That's important. All right, so let's just give this a try. If you're still working on it, don't worry about it. We'll get to it soon. So we're going to try this out. Here's a question. So it says, can you answer this? All right, can you answer this? And the answers are yes, 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 or no. So you can go ahead and choose an answer of whether you can answer this or not. <laughs> And uh, we'll see, see how this goes. I think there are 41, 42 people. It should auto stop. There we go. All right. Excellent. So the vast majority of people could, in fact, answer this question. Seven people are funny, which I like. I like that seven people decided to be funny. Um, you'll have opportunities to be funny if, uh, as we go on. So. I'm excited. Seems like it's up and running. Way to go, people who pick no. I like a playful audience. We'll see how this goes. All right, good. So, what's the plan? What am I going to talk to you about today? Uh, so first, you know, I was 
But when I got the invitation, I was given a form and it had learning goals on it. And so I'm, I want to make sure that we we know what we're here to learn about, right? Everyone's here to learn something. You're not here only to fill out the forms and evaluate me, right? You're here to learn. So, and then I'm going to talk about our shared experiences, right? How you and I are very similar in some ways, uh, for which you'll see. Then I'm going to talk about chemical ecology, the field, what it is, right? Um, some of the stories, classic stories from this field, because I think. Um, introducing people to a new field is so, a way to get people to open their eyes and see more of the world. And that's really what the liberal arts education is all about, right? You know, exposing people to a really broad in, uh, area so that not only do they know a wide area, but they can also synthesize different thoughts and ideas from disparate areas, uh, which makes people very innovative in what they do. And then finally, last, and not least, uh, this is my research and some of the stuff I've been doing. All right. So, all right. So, learning goals. When you leave here today, you should be able to define what chemical ecology is. Okay, that shouldn't be too hard. I'll tell you uh, when we get there. Be able to acknowledge the fact that the world around us is filled with organisms, and these organisms are interacting with each other mostly through chemical methods, right? And so you and I interact with the world mostly through physical methods, unless we're walking by a delicious Mason bakery, and then there's some chemical methods going on, right, as we smell that sweet, sweet uh, Saipan um, that I love so much. And, uh, but most of the world, most of the organisms are interacting with each other through chemical methods. And then finally, we're gonna, leave here thinking that insects are a really good place to look at chemical interactions because there's so many of them and because they have such complex interactions. All right, whoops, I went the wrong way. All right, there we go. So those were the learning goals. Now here are the secret learning goals. Okay. So, you know, they don't send a chemist to talk to a school that doesn't have a chemistry major unless they have ulterior motives, right? They must have some reason for bringing me in, and it's not to teach you about the hardcore chemistry, right? So there's secret learning goals. So when you leave here today, what I would like you to do is see the world around you as a place full of really cool stuff, right? Lots of opportunities to learn, whether it's chemical ecology, which is what called, to, called me, right? Or whether it's international finance or you know, insuring insurance, right? Whatever is out there that's really interesting to you, I want you to, to realize that that's an exciting opportunity to learn and explore. So then I want you to think, you know, if I'm seeing an opportunity, I'm willing to go explore and learn about it, right? So once you see an opportunity, sort of act on that, right? There's a lot of work that can be done and you'd be surprised how many simple ideas people haven't followed through on because they have assumed people have done it, right? Or, um, or they just don't think it would be important or interesting. Well, if you if it's interesting to you, it's going to be interesting to someone else. So you can do it. Right, go and do it. Then again, finally, confidence that you can make these new and exciting discoveries in whatever field that you do. So I think these are the real reasons that I should be here talking to you. All right. So first quiz, we're going to do our first quiz on Kahoot and see what you know about Leyon University. And this is based um, primarily off Wikipedia and your own website. So um, let's hope this goes well. If anything is horribly wrong, blame Wikipedia. Go, go edit it. Right? We can, we can fix it. So, um, again, I need to click something. There we go. Good. So I figured, since I had to learn all this stuff about Lingnan University, I better make sure you guys already know it, right? Since you're here. I tried to be nice. I didn't put in anything about uh, you know what year was it founded because that seems pretty complicated, 
right? It was founded in Gongzhou in 1888, and then it moved, and then it was refounded and renamed, and there's all sorts of exciting stuff. So I tried to keep it on the simpler end. 30, 32. Lucky Wildcats in Dynamic Giraffe is here, I think. A lot of dynamics. Witty Octopus, oh, that's nice. Oh, no. Social Fairy, the Lady Cat. All right. Oh, can we make it to 50? We might make it to 50. Hold out for those last two. 49. Oh, we're not going to make it to 50, are we? Okay, okay, we didn't make it to 50. All right, so we're going to have four questions. What do you know about Lingnan University? Okay, what are the school colors, right? They're everywhere, what are the school colors? There's a hint somewhere up here if you're, if you're struggling. Um, but let's see if people know what the school colors are. Three people are still contemplating in deep thought, two, one, good, that should do it. There we go, nice, nice, very good. We know what the school colors are, that's good. Now, my school colors are green and yellow. So, the one person who picked green and yellow, they, they probably were thinking too hard and thought it was, uh, they thought I was talking about my school. They looked at it. Okay, how many undergraduates here? How many undergraduates? 1,000, 2,500, 5,000, not enough? Let's see. Again, I tried to make sure that you could put in some smart aleck answers from time to time. There we go. Nice! Nice! And I... I put this one in here. I put this one in here, actually, because um, uh, some people might feel like 2,500 isn't enough, but I actually think that that's a really great number. It's very close to where I went to undergraduate and where I work now. Okay, what is the student to faculty ratio? So how many students are there per every faculty member? All right, so are there many, many students per every faculty? Are there very few? Like when you go to the cafeteria, you know, which I had to admit I thought was amazingly named. It's the dining hall, which is like the dining hall, and that is, Pretty darn fantastic. Um, anyway, so here we go. Let's see what the ratio is. Good, good. It's 12 to 1. Official university statistics. That wasn't Wikipedia. I had to scour your guys' website, the LU website for that one. Good. And then last, what percentage of undergraduates are female? Female. So are the you know, are there uh, about two men to every women, woman? Is there two women to every man? Half and half? Way over, way over one side or the other? See? This might tell you how people feel about it more than what they know. <laughs> See, why? I thought 49 was all I had. Why didn't you go to the answer? Eh, one side. Nice! People know their school. Good job. Yeah, I think these, the people who picked 80% are like, that's what it feels like sometimes. So, uh, anyway, very good. So, what a strange thing to talk about in a, in a seminar on chemistry. But the reason I did that is because I wanted to show our shared experiences, right? So, um, I currently work at Siena College. It's a college outside of uh, uh, Albany, New York. So three hours away from New York City, it's still quite a drive to get into New York City. I don't go there, I'm sort of scared of New York City. Okay, and, uh, but if you look, the size in undergraduates, very similar, right? It's also a small college. We have a similar student to faculty ratio, right? Um, we are majority female, not as majority, but still majority female. Uh, and when we look, when I scoured, this is based on my own eye, I looked at keywords from the value statements of most schools. Most schools talk about being student-centered. That makes sense, right? That they want whole person growth. They don't want you to be 
you know, um, super, super, super good at only one thing and completely inept at everything else, right? They want you to have a nice broad experience, be able to take ideas from multiple places and, and uh, combine the two into something new and innovative, and that's what the last one is. They want you to develop critical and creative thinking. And so I am a huge, huge proponent of the liberal arts uh, lifestyle and uh, institutions. I attended a liberal arts institution uh, for undergraduate on purpose, right? Like I wanted to go there. In the United States, if you want to go to a place with a student-faculty ratio like this, you have to pay uh, maybe five to ten times more than if you want to go to a big university with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of students in the class. So we love liberal arts institutions. And, uh, or at least I do, and many, many people are interested and are willing to pay extra for it. So I thought you should know that and, and appreciate what a great place you're in. Okay, so now let's get on to chemical ecology. Now that, you know, we've gotten to know each other, right? You know me and my, some of my experience. Uh, so we're going to talk about chemical ecology. Chemical ecology, right, here's our definition, you know, learning goal number one. Chemical ecology is the study of how organisms interact chemically. Right? And so organisms can interact chemically to members of their own species. Right? And so this is an example where there's a moth, a male moth and a female moth, and the female puts off something called a pheromone, right? And the pheromone attracts the male moth. Right? And that's uh, interaction between two members of the same species, okay? And so that's called a pheromone. When any, whenever two organisms of the same species are interacting chemically, those, are, those chemicals are called pheromones. And there's a lot of work that's been done on that. Very important. Things like mosquito traps, baiting in with pheromones, right? Things like that. All right? Uh, but just so you don't understand that this is more than just insects, it's pretty much every type of organism that communicates chemically some way or another. And uh, bacteria, right, the simplest of organisms, right, we, we won't have the argument about whether viruses count as organisms or not. Uh, uh, anyway, bacteria, right, they also communicate with each other chemically. They'll release pheromones called quorum sensing molecules, and those molecules will determine whether these things form biofilms, right? Uh, which, where, you know, have to be scraped off your teeth or whatever, right? So, uh, or whether they start producing toxins, right? So on and so forth. So these quorum sensing molecules are another type of pheromone, but again, released by bacteria, okay? Another interesting type of molecule are molecules called alimones. Okay? And what alimones are is they're a molecule released by one species that helps that species but uh, does not help the receiving species. Okay? So chemicals put out by one species helps it, doesn't help necessarily what gets it. Okay? So those are alimones. This picture is supposed to show an alimone, so there's a tree there's a tree um, in the United States, it's called Australian pine. I don't know what they call it here. But the needles, when they fall down, they leach out a chemical that prevents other plants from growing, right? And this is really advantageous to the tree because when its seeds fall, its seeds can grow, right? And so you get these groups of trees, these stands of trees that are all one type because only its seeds can grow. So that's it's another type of molecule that some chemical ecologists are interested in. This is a really cool example from the plant-insect interaction thing, another alimone. Turns out that there are these orchids, right? These beautiful plants, orchids. Some orchids release a compound that smells like a female wasp. So these male wasps fly up and pollinate the orchid, not because they're getting nectar, but instead because they think it's a female wasp and they think they're reproducing, right? So it's a really interesting study where the orchid, the plant, is releasing an alimone, right, that affects the, the, the wasp, not necessarily negatively, but it does increase the, the fitness of the, the orchid. So it's, it's benefit. Then a third type of molecule, uh, for a third class of molecule 
study by people do, uh, who are doing chemical ecology is called chiromones. Okay? And chiromones are molecules that are released by one organism that hurt it, right? That are to the detriment of the releasing organism. Okay? And so, for instance, pine trees, uh, pine trees have these compounds in them that prevent most insects from eating them, right? So in the, it's sort of like a, a chemical defense in that, in that uh, aspect. However, these, there are some specialized beetles that will s use their antenna and they will smell that, that molecule and then fly straight to that tree and start eating it, right? And so in that aspect, those molecules are acting as chiromones. Um, some people like to use the phrase uh, chemical eavesdropping for chiromones, right? The, the beetle is eavesdropping on this, this pine tree to find out where it is, and then they'll go and infest the tree. Okay, and then finally, the last classification of uh, chemicals typically studied by chemical ecologists like me are uh, chemical defenses. Okay? And this is what I found really cool. I always really liked chemical defenses. Right? I want to know how, what warfare is going on. Right? When I was a little kid, I always loved war. I don't know. I got over that as I grew up. That's what little boys do, I guess. But when I got older, I was like, hey, I can still study this, just in the chemical realm. Right? And so uh, do people know what these are here? Maybe they're in enough TV shows. Yeah, it's a skunk, right? And so these make really horrible smells, right? I don't know if they exist in China, but they're, they're in the US and they are, woo. Uh, you do not want to get interacting with that chemically because you will not be allowed back in the house by your parents, says someone who knows. Okay, um, but not only do mammals, can some mammals do this, insects do this. This is a really famous picture. Uh, some of the one of the earliest projects on insect chemical ecology was on these beetles that shoot. They, they have glands at the rear of their abdomen, and they shoot out boiling uh, chemicals. It's actually a mixture of water and benzoquinones, right? Anyway, these really cool toxic chemicals they shoot them out at boiling temperatures. They're called bombardier or bombardier beetles, depending on whether you want to use a French accent. Okay, plants. Plants also have chemical defenses. They do not want to get eaten, right? So plants don't want to get eaten, and so they make toxins. Things like strychnine, this is something that's a toxin. It's, uh, if you accidentally ingest it, you will stop breathing. So that's bad news for you, but good news for the plant, because you won't eat it anymore. And then uh, fungi also do, right? So we're talking about animals, plants, fungi, bacteria, lots of these organisms make chemical defenses. And so that's the area of chemical ecology that I really like. So we're gonna start talking about uh, some, just a few really neat examples of chemical ecology. So I'm going to try to do another Kahoot. Get ready, get the cell phones ready while I do this. It's not the smoothest of processes. Class, ready to join? I hope so. Make it happen. All right. Good. All right. So here we go. We've got our uh, pin number up there. You can join in. I'm waiting for exuberant zebra. Oh, lovely ant. That's good. Oh, majestic zebra. That's pretty close. <coughs> We're going to see what people know about talking trees. We've got to get at least 49 players because we had that last time. If we have less than that, it means someone's falling asleep. It's not good. If people start falling asleep, I'm going to move the microphone closer to my mouth. Alright. We'll go with 43. 44, Dr. Frog. Couldn't have talked about Dr. Frog. Yeah, Silver Jaguar, expert pigeon. And we're starting. All right, here we go. Talking trees, 
Are you ready? Okay, which statement is correct? Only humans can communicate. Only animals communicate. Only plants and animals can communicate. And all kingdoms of life can communicate. Those are our questions here. See if you've been paying attention. I didn't realize I was going to give away that answer. So hopefully, hopefully this. And I think that's all. I'm going to ask you. Nice, nice. Okay, those are the the five people who fell asleep and then woke up in time to take the quiz, as opposed to the three who fell asleep and stayed asleep. Good. All right. How about plants? How do plants communicate to each other? So do they send vibrations through the air or through the soil? Do they use visual signals of some sort or do they use chemical signals? Again, you can always go back and look at the title of my talk if you're interested in that. Good, it's chemical, right? With chemical signals, right? This is, this is how we communicate, right? That's how I'm communi communicating to you right now. But uh, plants, don't do that so much. They use chemical signals. Bronze Bunny is in the lead, followed closely by Smooth Cat. All right, so what organisms can detect a plant chemical signal? So other plants, maybe some herbivorous insects, insects that eat plants. How about parasitic insects that eat uh, the insects that are eating the plants or all of the above? Hopefully people won't notice that it's always been the green square. <laughs> all right, one second, one second, one second. Nice, good, right? All of them can, right? So there are plants that can pick up the chemical signals of another plant and it will actually change its response uh, to, uh, to insects based on what another plant has raised. All right, very good, smooth cat. All right, last but not least, how long have we known this, okay? Is this really new and modern? We've known this for about five years, 15 years, 35 years, 50 years. I mean, when I say we, how long have we known this? It doesn't include a you, right? Because I don't have 20 seconds on there necessarily. We'll see. We'll see if people fall for my trick of changing the last one so it's not the green square. Two seconds. Oh! Fell for my trick! Last one, I changed it. It's actually 35 years. For about 35 years, people have known this, uh, or at least it's been out in the literature. When it first came out, there was a lot of arguments about this. Okay, who, who won? Brave Crane won. That's nice. Wise Panda should have won. Wise Panda got robbed. Uh, I love that, that name. Okay, very good. Okay, so uh, it turns out that uh, it is now pretty well established. And although when it was first came out in about 1983, some of the first papers came out saying that uh, willow trees uh, produced this compound methyl jasmine when they were chewed on by an insect. And that other willow trees would then respond to that by making chemicals to defend themselves against insects, right? When that first came out, scientists didn't want to believe it, right? That's one of the, the best things about science. That's why we trust science so well, is because other scientists are skeptics all the time, right? They're like, Psh, no, prove it. Show me again and again and again. And now 35 years later, it's widely accepted. It's, people have shown it in common, uh, uh, magazines as well as scientific journals. Now it's in things like National Geographic magazine has had whole spreads on how plants communicate to each other. They can communicate not only through the air, but through these uh, mycorrhizal fungal symbionts. So there's, there's fungi that grow on the roots of trees and connect them to other plants, right? And they can actually send signals back and forth through these fungi. It's some really, really cool stuff but stuff that isn't that well known throughout the, uh, the uh, general population. It's mostly known within scientific communities. All right, so the second of the, the chemical ecology things I would like to talk about, no quiz for this one, you can feel happy about that. Wise Panda will have to wait another day. 
All right, so uh, is this topic of borrowing toxins, okay? So uh, in the United States, we have a butterfly like this. It's called the monarch butterfly, beautiful butterfly. There's one very, very similar here in the same genus. I think it's called the common tiger. It's called the something tiger. I think it's a common tiger. Um, and uh, people for a while didn't know uh, how it, it survived when it was this colorful, right? It's so bright and beautiful, birds must eat it all the time. And then people started to notice that if a bird eats it, that bird will throw up horribly, right? So if what you were hoping to see today was a picture of a bird throwing up, you have now been rewarded. So in fact, it's really, really hard to, this, this picture took a long time for someone to get to research because wild birds won't even try it because they've been exposed to them in the wild somehow. Right? So people had to raise blue jays indoors so that they had never seen one of these in order to do the, the tests that they did. So uh, people wanted to know, what is it about these butterflies? Right? So now we know they're not eaten, even though they're brightly colored, uh, because they're toxic. But we don't know why they're toxic, how they get that toxic. And so someone came along and said, well, uh, they're larvae, they're caterpillars, Right? feed on milkweed, and milkweed happens to be toxic. Milkweed has compounds like this. They're called, uh, sometimes they're called cardenolides or cardiac glycosides. Uh, if you know the term cardio, meaning having to do with the heart, right? this means that they affect the hearts of something. And so um, these plants aren't typically eaten by, let's say, a rabbit or some other small mammal because they have these compounds. And so, People came along and said, uh, well, are these compounds actually in the monarch butterfly? Are they stealing it from the plant and using it for their own good? And they found out that yes, in fact, they were. So that was a, a lot of work as well to prove, uh, but they did that. So now, when we look at it from a chemical ecology standpoint, we, we can sort of take the butterfly and put it out of our mind and say, well, it's the chemical that they're eating. Right? It's that chemical they're eating that came from the milkweed that in fact is going poorly for them. And I should, I should quickly mention that this idea of being very bright and obviously colored right, is something called aposematism. Right? And you're sending a signal to your possible attacker right, that you are not to be eaten because they will not like it. Right? All right, very good. Okay. So that was chemical ecology. We'll get back to chemical ecology because that's what I do. But um, when I was in graduate school, I actually did something called natural products chemistry. And this is an extension of chemical ecology. And what it is is saying, OK, there's lots of great chemicals out there in nature. How can we find some that are useful to people? Right? We want to take some of these compounds that are out there in nature and help people with them. Right? And that's the field called natural products chemistry. And so these statistics all come from the US, right? The US Department of Health. Uh, and so it turns out way back in 1900, before the first natural antibiotics were, were discovered, right? Penicillin, streptomycin, before those, the leading causes of death were things like pneumonia, tuberculosis, and different diseases that cause diarrhea, right? And these are all bacterial diseases. So, uh, much, much later, after the development of antibiotics, 1997, in the US, all of a sudden, these bacterial diseases aren't killing people nearly so much. And what people are dying of instead is heart disease. Right? They're dying of heart disease. Um, and uh, you know, one could argue that that's better because they typically have lived longer than the people who are dying of bacterial diseases. Right? If you look, children under 5 are 30% of all people who died in the US in 1900 whereas there were only 1.5% of all deaths in 1997. So natural products, these chemicals from nature have been really helpful to people, okay? Now something changed between 1997 and 2011. And what that was, was the introduction of compounds for lowering cholesterol, okay? These were also natural compounds. And so uh, these compounds that came from a mold, right? Lovastatin here. Uh, that comes from a mold that someone found growing on an orange, right? 
in, uh, in Japan. And so uh, it turns out that that cholesterol lowering, people taking cholesterol lowering agents as well as exercising when we're trying to be more fit, meant that the heart disease rate dropped quite a bit. Now, if people aren't dying of bacterial diseases as much, and they're not dying of heart disease as much, they'll probably be dying of cancer now unfortunately, right? However, we'll notice that that stayed the same, right? This should have gone up as this went down. But again, more chemicals from nature were found that actually help uh, fight against cancer. So this is a really cool compound called vinblastin. I love the chemical structure, it's so complicated, right? But it actually is something that's an anti-cancer agent and it comes from a pretty little flower called the Madagascar parent. It's really cool. I've seen them growing here um, in flower, flower beds. All right, but I shouldn't be telling you guys anything new here, right? And Chinese medicine has been using natural compounds to treat illnesses for a long, long, long time, right? And so uh, there is an anti-cancer compound called camptothecan, which is used, right? It, this is used in Western medicine now, but originally it was uh, used as the plant uh, plant material uh, in Chinese medicine. And probably the most famous example was uh, ertamicidin found to uh, uh, fight malaria and uh, especially quinine resistant malaria, right? Artemisinin, which was discovered by Chu Yo Yo, who won the 2005 Nobel Prize in Medicine for it. Uh, she is an amazing woman here in, uh, in Beijing. She uh, never did, stu she never studied in the West. She did everything in China um, and, and, and is still a Nobel Prize winner and is fantastic, so it's great. Okay, so that's our back, right? Now it's time to start talking more about me, right? I can't talk for this long without wanting to talk about me some more. Okay, so let's do that. Um, when I was an undergraduate, right, in your position, uh, I started doing my first research, and what I researched was snakes, okay? So I was at a school, had 2,000 undergraduate students, and I had a biology professor there who studied snakes, and um, he let me come into his lab, and I had a, a biochemistry professor who said, uh, snake venom's mostly proteins, uh, you can use use my uh, equipment to run gels on your proteins and see what venoms are in the snakes. So that's, I did that as an undergraduate. It was really nice. Um, this was all in Florida, at a small school in Florida, and uh, called Stetson University, which hopefully, well, no, I shouldn't say hopefully, but probably no one's ever heard of it. So anyway, that was, that was my undergraduate experience. When I went to graduate school, I started working on fungal and plant compounds, okay, because my graduate advisor, he was a natural products chemist, and he wanted to find new antifungal compounds for treating fungal infections, and uh, investigate what kind of compounds are in peanuts, because people might be eating them, right? And so uh, I, I published a series of papers on fungal compounds and on plant compounds. Hopefully you're starting to see some sort of pattern. I've worked in the animal kingdom, I've worked in the fungal kingdom, I've worked in the plant kingdom, right? If people still use kingdoms instead of domains, I do. Uh, and then finally I went to do my postdoctoral work uh, at Cornell University, and that's when I started working on bugs, right? I looked at some cool beetles. Uh, that's a US penny about the size of the, the uh, 10, 10 cent piece here in Hong Kong and uh, the beetle is smaller than the, the width of that. But we looked at them, it only took us 50,000 of those beetles to figure out the chemistry, right? And uh, we got some really cool chemistry. 